Welcome to Zambition, the channel on which we engage in dialogue with leaders from across sectors and generations. Greetings and welcome to Zambition. My name is Martin Kalungubanda, your host on this channel. This episode of Zambition is part two of our dialogue with Dr. Akashambatwa Mbikusta Lewanika. In the first episode, he shared about his origins and what journey he has walked, what has shaped his thoughts and practices. He has also reflected on some of his views on the journey that we have walked as a country. In this segment of my dialogue with him, I will begin by asking him what his ambition is. Dr. Mbikustalewanika, what is your highest aspiration for our country? What is your ambition? I wish it was an ambition. I wish it was an aspiration. I, and it would have been, and it was in 1990. Because as I say, I came into it with naivety, with audacity, with the spirit of youth and not knowing all the obstacles. Unfortunately, at my age now, with my experience, I am no longer naive. Mm. And I don't have illusions. And uh, therefore, but although it's not an ambition and an aspiration, it is my deepest wish, wish, not only for Zambia, but for the whole of Africa, that a new generation will be born which will be free from being afraid of re-examining our history, maybe undressing some of our heroes, maybe changing our visions, which we have been, the narrative that has been taught to us. In other words, a generation that will be prepared to be really radical, and resolve to re-decolonize. Because what happens in October 24 for Zambia mm -hmm. has already been called decolonization. Yes. But it was not decolonization enough. That's where we are now. So you need to re-decolonize it and you have to be prepared to have the audacity, the courage to go back to the drawing board with no sacred cows of personalities, mm -hmm. no sacred cows of interest, no sacred cows of present comforts. And how it requires that, a lot of courage. How would that happen? Because as you said earlier on, people come with vested interests. If- yeah, but, but you know, Martin, you are talking about how students at the University of Zambia in 1991, you were able to see people rise up. Mm -hmm. And you follow. So, I mean, uh, I, I, I sometimes say we founded MMD and so on. But the truth is that all we did was light a torch. Other people had tried before to light this torch. Mm -hmm. And other people had said what we were saying. But it required the right occasion and the right combination of factors, which we are not under the control of anybody, for that spark to catch fire. Yeah. Uh, but part of the reason it caught fire was because we, we had the credibility 
of really being honest and selfless, prepared to sacrifice so that wherever we went, whether it was a provincial capital, a district bomber, uh, people welcomed us the minute they had heard our clarion call at Garden. They couldn't wait to meet us. And when they met us, they merely confirmed that we were echoing their thoughts and their desires. So the agenda was a people's agenda. So the, and they were prepared to feed us. We flew all over the country, we went by bus, we went by cars all over the country, and we were hosted by local people. Hmm. We would come to a place like Mungu, we don't even know who has arranged for cars to pick us up. We don't know who has booked us into a hotel. We don't know who has paid. After a meeting, if we say we want to go to Snanga, say no, you can't leave, we have prepared food. That is the situation that was there in 89, 90. So people were prepared for change. They were prepared to follow leaders who convinced them that they were selfless, that they were sacrificing, and they are working on their behalf. Unfortunately, after, just like after independence, after the return to multi-party democracy, within the first term, not even the first term of the president, I'm talking about the first session of parliament. Mm -hmm. The way we members of parliament returned to our constituency with 54, $64,000, four by four brand new cars, some of us had no bicycle. The three months in uh, Parliament Motel made our skin glow. Our faces puff up. Our walk had an added spring. Whereas we could beg for accommodation, I remember in Calabo sleeping, uh, some teachers sacrificing their homes for Mr. Chiruva to stay there and me to stay in their home, and they stayed in the classroom. But when you return from parliament three, four months later, you can't even stay in a local government guest house because your standards have risen. So that now people are getting signals that we went there to eat, we went there to get cars, and our behavior convinces them that they were mistaken by putting faith in us, that we were changing these things for nationalist reasons, for social service, for their interest. So they also became mercenaries. When you campaign, they say, pay us first, because once you go to Lusaka to eat, you won't come back or you forget us. So they are now actually the masses of the people it's a very revolutionary reaction, actually. They are punishing us leaders. You know, I mean, it's very irritating that wherever you go, people are begging. But part of this begging is actually punishing a class of people who have betrayed the promise of returning to multi-party democracy, who have betrayed the promise of independence, and who are now, the people, ordinary people are convinced that most of us are in it for ourselves. And this is what makes it doubly difficult. What words can I say, mm. which are different from all these other liars who are pretending to be running for parliament to help people? The people are no longer that stupid. They are no longer that naive. They can no longer give us their faith as easily as they did in 1990. If we had not betrayed them in 1990, we could have changed the Zambia in any direction. I don't know, you, you were a student then. Mm -hmm. The last rally we held in Lusaka. Yeah. The first rally in Lusaka, Pops, it rained and the people didn't go away. Yeah. The rally we held at Kafue, Mr. Chiluba said, are you prepared to sacrifice for Zambia? They said, yes. And I believe the people were honest, but their leaders were not honest.
They didn't go to state house to sacrifice. They didn't go to parliament to sacrifice. They didn't become minister to sacrifice. Instead, they expected people to sacrifice for their comfort. So that is the real challenge that we have. So my, my wish for mm -hmm. Africa is that a new generation will be able. I, I'm saying that I don't believe it's impossible. Yeah. I believe that as rational people, if you could just convince people that our problem is not today's problem, it's not a personal problem, it's not a question of a party. Because it's not, I mean, Zambia has changed president six times, so has changed ruling parties three times. Yeah. There's been no change. But people, I believe, still believe that one more change of party, one more change of the president, one more opportunity for you yourself to be an MP can bring change. So until we convince them that the problems are deeper than that, and the problems can have been caused very systematically, you can trace step by step from pre-independence days, how we have arrived where we are. So you can actually retrace it. Take the constitution of Zambia, for instance, as I said, the constitution, yes, the British had their own interest, but the, the various interest groups participated in a negotiated settlement. None of them got everything they wanted, and none of them uh, uh, were 100% happy with it but they were all prepared to go into Zambia together with white European settlers, together with Barossalan, together with the opposition party, together with the ruling party. We agreed that on the basis of this constitution, it's not perfect, it's not how we wanted it or how we would like it to be, but we can, it is manageable. It gives us enough confidence to go together. Immediately after that constitution was made, and since it was already not perfect, it was already had features of over concentration of power, over personalization of power, and a, a very easy path towards the ruling party capturing mm -hmm. the state. But in addition to that, we then systematically have been introducing legislation, changes in regulation, changes in practices and behavior that have made a bad situation worse, that have step by step now legalized the personalization of leadership, now legalized the ownership of a government by a ruling party, so that it became almost normal for you to say, this is a unique government. This is an MMD government. Yeah. This is a PF government. I mean, what sort of ridiculousness is that? The government should be a, a people's government. Yeah. And the people must form that government. Those who are elected to go and administer that government does not mean that they own that government or that they are supposed to administer it on behalf of their party cadres or on behalf of themselves. In other words, whether you voted for them, whether you agree with them, you, have an, you are an equal shareholder in that government. But we think it's normal for someone to stand uh, lecturing, talking about my government, yeah. the PF government, the MMD government, the UNIP government. So we have to unnormalize those sort of things. People should, should really be very annoyed when they hear that. Because what it means is that this government is not yours as a people. It belongs to a ruling party, or it belongs to an individual minister, or it involves it belongs to an individual president. So that I think that if we can go on a campaign to signal to them that the changes required to make Zambia fulfill its promise of independence mm. and respect its uh, addiction, its uh, declaration as a democratic society. 
are not against anybody. When we returned Zambia to a multi-party state, it was not an act against UNIP because the same freedom that we acquired to, for non-UNIP people, we did not take it away from UNIP people. So every Zambian, UNIP or not UNIP, MMD or not MMD, you have the right to form or not form, to join or not join, a political party of your choice. So we, sometimes you have to ask yourself that, how do you know when a program is nationalist? You know a program is nationalist if once it is fulfilled, everybody wins. Yeah. Everybody gains. If you bring a change in the constitution where uh, we Nazalila, it does not matter whether it's a good thing, whether those who are crying are stupid or ignorant, as long as there's somebody crying, you have not had any victory. You have added to the injuries to this country. So that, that, so that the changes required are not in themselves against anybody. Those who think that these changes are against them are deluded. Because you may think that these changes will make you less able to steal public coffers and you want to steal public coffers to benefit personally. But these benefits, all these thieves in Africa who've stolen public coffers, where are they? Where will their grandchildren, great grandchildren be? So, so that he, actually, if we create a, such a clean society, a non corrupt society, a democratic society, everybody gains. Yeah. One, one philosopher said the best way to make rules of society is to be in a position for the lawmakers to be in a position, the veil of ignorance, where they don't know what strength, what advantage or disadvantage they would have in society. If there was such an artificial way of not knowing what your position is, economic or political, and you are invited to make the rules of the game, you are likely to make the fairest of rules so that whether you are on the strong or weak side, you do not become worse off. But that is only in imagination. Exactly. How can we do that practically? Well, let's say we are now doing the opposite of that practically, isn't it? <laughs> and it is leading to this mess. And it doesn't matter whether we do this thing practically, this wrong thing practically for a hundred years, it will be reproducing the disaster it has already produced. And this disaster is cancerous. If it is bad today, tomorrow it will be worse. Yeah. So that, you see, the, it may be difficult, it may be uh, theoretical, but you have to now ask that those who are doing the easy things, those who are doing the practical things, are the ones that have ruled Zambia for six decades. So if being easy, mm -hmm. being practical was the answer, Zambia would have no problem. That is basically the, the, the challenge. And sometimes, like now, I think you have gotten my spirit that I'm on the verge of giving up on Zambia. But there's something in me that even when I pray that I should just have the luxury of just giving up, yeah. there is faith in me as a revolutionary that somehow I don't know how if we it is better to face the challenges and to drive towards the right path, mm -hmm. even when we don't know when that path will reach paradise. Than for us to say we are practical men, 
So we accept mediocrity, we accept corruption, we accept personalization of leadership, we accept the ruling party to possess the government. I, would tell, I mean, I find that harder to accept yeah. than to maintain my faith that change is possible. Dr. Ambikustali Wanika, my final question is, what is the best piece of advice you have ever received? <laughs> ah, too, too many, too many. I, 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 I mean, some of them are very amusing. Uh, I remember when I was general manager of Kito, as I told you, I was never unique. But one day, a relative of mine who was in unique leadership came to me that there's a by-election in Inkana. Mm -hmm. And uh, we want you to stand, young people like you, that we want to stand. So I told him that, uh, one, I'm not unique. He said, forget that. That can be arranged. <laughs> but you have, you have rules that you have to have been in the party for three years, whatever. He said, listen, I am unique. You say you're not unique. So that is unique business. What other reason are you refusing to be an MP? Then I said, uh, you see, this by-election has been caused by the death of a friend of mine who had died in a car accident. And his younger brother, I'm told, wants to stand. And I feel bad. I would feel bad to stand against the younger brother of my friend who has died tragically. So this man said, OK, any other problems? I said, no. So I said, okay, then tomorrow after work, I'll come and pick you up. We are going to go to that young, younger brother of your friend. Mm -hmm. I don't want you to say anything, but I'll tell the younger, the younger brother of your friend that uh, Aka has been chosen to run in this seat. And I'll wait to hear whether he will say, oh, then I don't want to stand because Aka was my friend my brother's friend. <laughs> so that, that, so I think what that meant really is that every now and then, sometimes you give consideration to people who themselves will not give you that consideration, which is related to the last statement you say, that people will make rules which will be good for us regardless of whether we are winners or losers or majority or minority, mm -hmm. we we'll have much better. So even our relationship, in other words, if I was to examine the mistakes or the shortcomings of the changes that we tried to bring in 91, uh, I think that is that we didn't know each other. I didn't know the people I was organizing. Uh, they probably knew each other better than me. So that I think the other good advice I was given when I resigned from Mr. Chiruba's government, I came to Mungu to explain to my constituency why I've resigned mm -hmm. from cabinet. And when I was in Mungu, it was really heated debate. People were asking questions, wanted an explanation. They accepted by and home my resignation. But once I went to a more rural part, yeah. when I tried to open the, the, the topic of justifying my resignation, one old man said, no, don't waste your time. We've been wondering how you are managing to work with those people. You see, so, so that I think the, the advice that he gave me, that old man gave me indirectly, was to have faith in ordinary people. Have faith in ordinary people. Yes, that we have more to learn from them and they know much more which we need to know than we give them an opportunity. Because when we approach them, we approach them with ready-made solutions. There is a project I was doing recently. I hope I don't review what it is. Uh, but there was a conflict between us as consultants and our employers. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. our employers wanted us to conduct a sensitization project to go to the people and sensitize them. We wanted to consult a consultative process. Mm -hmm. And the difference is that with sensitization, you assume that ordinary people are stupid or ignorant and they need enlightenment. And that the job of those of us who think we are enlightened is to go to them and sensitize them rather than consult with them. And I think that uh, wherever we went, apart from that, that is inclined to be how I approach things, how I wanted things to be. But it was also a clear message wherever we held meetings. Mm. The first or second question would be basically, have you come to consult us or you have come to tell us something you've already decided upon? So the, from this, what I've learned is that it was not just this particular project. It's our whole governance system, which assumes that the people at the top, the people at the center, the people in Lusaka, the people in Washington know better. Yeah. And that the people away from those centers of power have nothing to contribute. So that I think is a very, very important. And added to that is the fact that when you re-examine our traditional African governance system, mm -hmm. this Western system we have adopted, which looks so modern, so democratic, is actually not. Because it is a pyramid mm -hmm. with power being at the smallest point on top. The African governance system is an upside down pyramid. And uh, I was given that enlightenment almost at every consultative meeting we went to. That what is wrong with many of these things is that already decided things are the ones being proposed. And uh, what gave me encouragement is the resistance in the villages, in the rural areas of people against dictatorship. They don't often have a chance to express their resistance because it's quite costly. But I was able to have a glimpse at that resistance, that skepticism, uh, that sometimes even when we said we have come to consult you, they say, no, 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 tell us the truth. What do you yourself think? And say, no, I want what you think. So, so that basically, uh, indirectly, that is also the advice. Yeah. That the advice that uh, is most current in my heart and in my mind now is that there is much more in our tradition. There is much more in our ordinary people that we have ignored to the detriment of this society we are trying to create and that we must re-examine, maybe respect a little bit more. Let ideas and decisions be a result of consultation from the roots to the top, rather than sensitization from the top to the bottom. Dr. Mbikustalewanika, I can listen to you all day, all week. Thank you very much for sharing your wisdom. I am relieved to learn that Although you have seen many disappointments in terms of intentions to improve on our governance system, you still keep the faith that one day we will stumble on leaders or there will be leaders, not just in Zambia, but across Africa, who truly want to set rules that honor the wisdom of our people and entrust the power that our people truly deserve. Thank you very much for your time. Amen. Thank you so much. I'm glad that the technology has at last cooperated with us. <laughs> Wonderful. I leave you Thank to you. rest now. Thank you so okay, much. Have a, have a good night. Good night. Thank you. Having listened to the dialogue and followed my conversation with our guest, I now invite you to look at the drawing that emerged out of that dialogue. Take time to
to see the contours, the colors, the images that are reflected on the painting, on the drawing. And pay attention to what the drawing evokes in you. What are the feelings? What are the thoughts that are ignited by you looking at the painting? What thoughts does the painting generate in you with regard to your own leadership? What thoughts, feelings, and images does this painting evoke in you with regard to the future of our country? Kindly share your reflections on this channel so that we can continue the dialogue on the future of the country we all love, on the future of our nation. Thank you.